Hi, I'm Ashley Ravache. I'm the vice president of the San Francisco League of Women Voters. <laughs> and as you can tell, I'm a little nervous to be among such wonderful women. Our mission is to encourage informed and active participation of citizens in government and promote public policy through issues of education and advocacy. Like the Commonwealth Club, the League was founded as a non-profit, non-partisan organization after the long struggle to win votes for women in the United States almost 100 years ago. From that perspective, I am particularly honored to introduce our guest, Kirsten Gillibrand, Senator from the state of New York. She is here to talk about her work in government and her new book, Off the Sidelines, Raise Your Voice, Change the World, which is a call to action for women to use their voices to lead in their communities. Senator Gillibrand will, re will be joined in conversation with Cheryl Sandberg, Chief Operating Officer of Facebook and founder of Lean In. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and Cheryl Sandberg. So uh, welcome everyone to this uh, pretty warm, really nice day in San Francisco. We're so excited everyone could come out uh, to welcome Senator Gillibrand to our fair city. Welcome. Thank you. Perfect weather. And thank you for that lovely introduction and for the work you do on behalf of women all over. So we're here to talk about this book, Off the Sidelines, uh, Raise Your Voice and Change the World. And this book, as I read it, and I got a chance to read it a little bit earlier, um, is such a good reflection of the woman who's sitting on the stage with us, who graces our fair city today, who has become a friend for me over the past couple of years, but who more importantly, I think is a friend of every woman in this country, in this world, who needs a voice. And this book shares her story, but it also talks more broadly about the importance of every woman and men using their voice for things they care about. Um, and it's such a pleasure to be able to talk through it uh, with, Senator, with the senator today. So Off the Sidelines has been a New York Times bestseller. It has created a lot of news. Big shock. There's still sexism in the Senate. <laughs> People were floored. Um, but it's really uh, the words of a real leader. So let's start at the beginning. You've got stuff to do. You're a busy kind of woman. You've got kids. You've got a job. Yeah. Why'd you write a book? Well, I wanted to talk about this notion that women's life experiences are very different, that our views of the world are different, and that those differences are actually good. So I wanted to write a book about some of the stories that I experienced. It's part memoir, part call to action, and part how-to to really encourage women to be heard, to be heard on the issues you care about, because when you're not heard on those issues, outcomes um, would be much better if they were. So for example, when I was in the House of Representatives, uh, when I was first elected in 2006, Speaker Pelosi put five women on the Armed Services Committee. Now, to put five freshman women at one go was a big transition for that committee, and it changed what we talked about. We were having hearings on military readiness, and our male colleagues focused a lot on how many guns, how many ships, how many aircraft, normal stuff. But the women talked about something very different. Gabby Giffords uh, talked about how she, the, the doctor at the base in her district told her that 70% of the men and women going back into combat were not mentally ready. And so I amplified that and said, why is the domestic violence rate and divorce rate and suicide rate higher than it's ever been in the history of America? And so together, the combination of both military equipment and military personnel was a more holistic view of what is military readiness. So the presence of women alone and their differences made for a stronger debate and very different outcomes. So whether it's at the PTA meeting or whether it's at the boardroom, women's voices do change outcomes. And I think it makes a real difference. Yes. 
Uh, so the book tells, in I think uh, a really beautiful narrative, the story of your background. And you start by talking about the importance of women raising their voice, not just for themselves, but for supporting each other. And you start by talking about the polys in your life, your mm -hmm. mother and grandmother. How did their experiences as working mothers guide your career? Well, both my uh, mother and my grandmother were, were two of my greatest role models. My mother was definitely a trailblazer. She was only one of three women who went to law school in her law school class. She uh, loved being a very hands-on, present mom. She made all our clothes when we were little. She loved cooking and baking. She loved when my girlfriends came over. But my memories of her is her always multitasking, having her be on the phone with this very long phone cord, that's when phones had cords, uh, stretched into the middle of the kitchen while she's cooking dinner, de dealing with some details of an adoption case, while saying, hi, honey, how was your day? And I remember how, um, how balanced her life was, that she really felt this was all part of her. And meanwhile, by the time she was my age, she was a second degree black belt. So she also made time for herself. <laughs> Um, my grandmother was also very much um, a, a woman uh, who was powerful in her own right. She never went to college. She was a secretary in our state legislature. She worked every day of her life. But she recognized 75 years ago when women had very little role or voice in public life that in order to be heard, the best way to do it was to amplify her voice with those of other women's voices and that together they would be heard. So these women formed grassroots advocacy networks where they did door-to-door -door work and envelope stuffing and phone banking for candidates they loved. And she just struck me as someone who really owned her ambition. She was somebody who wanted to be heard. She made it happen. And over 50 years, she became very powerful. In fact, you couldn't get elected in Albany if you didn't have the blessing of my grandmother and her lady friends because <laughs> they did all the work. So I grew up with these great role models about being exactly yourself, that you can be who you are, you can embrace who you want to be, and that you don't have to make choices between being the mother you want to be and, and having the life you want to live at the same time. I loved your stories of your grandmother. I have a gra had a grandmother as well who uh, was a force to be reckoned with. And she, had, um, she was, never had a profession, because in her day, women weren't supposed to have that. Your mm -hmm. grandmother was a real exception. But she had breast cancer at a very young age. And then she went on to raise you know, millions of dollars which was a lot in those days and still is, um, for a clinic. And I often wondered what her life would have been like if she had lived in our day and, mm -hmm. day and time. Like, what would she have done? What would she have done with she all those opportunities? She would have been president of the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I think she would have. For sure. Have you done that same experiment? Can you fast forward yeah, your my grandmother? grandmother? What would she yeah, have? many things. Um, but, you know, for all of us, and the reason why I loved in your book that you told, Cheryl, about your parents and how smart your mother was and how intelligent and uh, opinionated she was and how that formed you. All of us have role models in our lives, whether it's our mothers, our grandmothers, whether it's your favorite teacher, whether it's a lady next door. And all of us can benefit so greatly from having someone to look up to, to envision yourself doing what they're doing. Also, it's true, it's helpful to have mentors and helpful to have sponsors, all different roles that will help you in your career. And for all of us, you know, we can help one another. You know, I, I, I talk about how Hillary Clinton was a mentor of mine. By the time I was elected to Congress, that whole mentoring relationship took mo no more than 90 minutes, over a decade. But that's all it took. It was just these little snippets of advice and guidance when I needed them most. I never had the benefit of a sponsor. But I knew enough to have a role model, to have these mentors. They helped me along the way. And all of us can be that role model, be that mentor. You, Maya, could mentor the seven-year-old. Because you've already been there. You've been seven before. You know what to do. And your little bits of advice to that seven-year-old would be invaluable because she doesn't know. She's not 10 yet. So that's the kind of thing that all of us can do wherever we are in our lives. And, and that's why I bother to tell these vignettes to show it can be right around you. It doesn't have to be you know, someone really powerful or important. It could be just someone who owns their ambition and wants to do the thing they do. So I knew before the book that you went to Dartmouth as an undergrad. But I did not know before the book and all the you know, interviews you've given around it that you studied Asian studies. Mm -hmm. Not as well known fact about you. Um, but it was clearly very influential in your progress. Can you talk about that a little bit? Why you did it and what you think it led to in Beijing? Yes. Well, one of my friends, B. Dana, is here, uh, who went to China <laughs> with me. She's right there. Wow. Welcome. Um, a number of uh, Dartmouth. One of the reasons I chose Dartmouth over any other school was because I really wanted to do study abroad. One of the things my mother taught me, she was always fascinated in other cultures, other kinds of cooking, other cultural backgrounds. And so my goal in high school was to travel, and I wanted to continue that in college. And so 
when I went to Dartmouth, we had an, a non, uh, non-Western requirement. So I took Chinese one to learn how to spell my, you know, write my name in Chinese. I thought that would be cool. But I loved it so much that I focused my whole education on Asian studies. And so I went to Beijing uh, to study for three months and then followed that by another three months in Taiwan, really learned Mandarin. And you know, as a young high school girl, looking back, I was fearless. These girls and I, Dana and I, and two other girls, we went to every city in China every weekend and never batted an eye. I, I would be f- very upset if my son did what I did in high school. <laughs> I would be very fearful that he was so bold. But we, we traveled the country. We learned uh, from these amazing experiences. The one experience I do share, which is funny, is when we went to this one uh, beach, beach uh, resort called Bei Dai He, and we had a fabulous weekend and had all these lovely crabs and delicious seafood. Well, when we got back, we were so sick. We had the worst food poisoning ever. And so to get to the hospital, we had to ride on the back of our friend's bicycles because that's how you got around in Beijing as a student. And the way to cure this disease was a black vial of liquid that they told us was toad venom. <laughs> so down we took it. And our other roommate was Connie Britton. And so Connie Britton, who plays um, on Friday Night Lights and plays in Nashville, was one of the, the, the four pillars of our foursome. So That's we had great. quite a good time. And it's did really- Did she sh- sing? She, she did sing back then. She <laughs> sang and danced. In fact, there was one day at the US Embassy where I think she lip synced to Madonna and won. <laughs> <laughs> so you have many great chapters, but of course my personal favorite is called Ambition is Not a Dirty Word. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people know the data that we, we really embrace ambition in boys. And ambition in women is uh, harder because yep. it goes against those stereotypes. I'm going to do a little poll I've done uh, in many audiences. Men only, men only. Please raise your hand if anyone's ever told you you're too ambitious or too aggressive. There's always a few, just men only, men only first. There's always a few. Women, please raise your hand if anyone's ever told you you're too ambition, ambitious or too aggressive. Your or hand or is too up. pushy. <laughs> or too pushy, mouthy. Shrill, or too shrill, yeah. shrill, shrill, hands up. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see right here what we know. Um, so let's talk about that. Yeah. I mean, you are ambitious. Yeah. You ran for I'm Congress. Actually, you ran for I'm Senate. An amb- I'm an ambitious feminist. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so Cheryl and I study these topics from our two different industries. She really gets what's happening in corporate America and some of the challenges, and I really study what happens in public life and in, in government service and politics. But the studies do show. So if you have a picture of a man who's, this is an ambitious man, the people reviewing the picture says, oh, he must be a leader, he must be strong, he must be a go-getter. This is a picture of an ambitious woman. Ooh, she must be cold, she must be calculating, she must be self-centered. Opposite views of just the word ambitious. So if we just leave the word aside and say, what is ambition? All ambition is is having big dreams, having high goals, and working hard to achieve them. If you asked anyone in this room or anyone in America, do you believe your daughter should have high hopes, big dreams, and work hard to achieve them? Everybody would say, of course. So my view is, who cares about the word? Let's talk about what we all embrace, and that's we believe our women and girls should dream big and try hard to achieve their dreams. And that's something we can all agree on. And so we can own the word and just say, I'm ambitious, or just say, I dream big and work hard to achieve my goals. It doesn't really matter. Um, And then the second word is feminism. You ask a young woman, are you a feminist? And she might say, I don't believe in burning bras, and I like men. Well, that's not what feminism is. (laughs) But if you ask them, if you ask them, do you believe in equality for all? And do you believe girls should have the same opportunities as boys? They would say, of course they do. And so again, these words may have a lot of weight to them, but the meaning is something we can all embrace. And so don't be afraid to be an ambitious feminist. Absolutely. Yay. So when we, as I started out, as I said, when we started out, big shocking news in this book that there's still uh, sexism in the halls of the U.S. Congress. People were shocked and appalled, which (laughs) is funny. And a lot of those comments were about people making comments on your physical appearance. But there's a story in here that has gotten less attention that I think is equally or more important, which is about breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So, um, (sighs) so uncomfortable. (laughs) Okay, so... When I was first uh, appointed to the U.S. Senate, um, I was appointed because Secretary Clinton was elevated to be Secretary of State. And at the time, I was nursing my second son, Henry. He was about six or seven months old. 
And in the Senate, you're given certain duties. And one of the duties to junior senators is they preside over the Senate, which means they sit at the big desk and look out to the chairs. And normally, if people are talking, it's really interesting. You're listening to the debate, and it's very exciting. But sometimes no one's there, so it can be terribly tedious. And so I was given the slot of five to seven. Now, I could not do five to seven. And if anybody's ever had a child who's been nursing knows there is a nursing schedule. Your nursing schedule <laughs> is usually in the morning, sometime around lunch, and then sometime around dinner, and then sometime before bed. And that's a normal nursing schedule. So five to seven is the nursing time, which means you either have to nurse that baby or you need to pump. And I have to explain this to a young 20-something who's never had kids and doesn't have a wife. And I can't describe the feelings I would be going through mm -hmm. if I had to be sitting there presiding at the US Senate. So I just begged for a different time slot, and he would not give it to me. So I eventually went to um, my colleagues and just called all the other junior senators and said, would you please change time slots with me, and explained my predicament. And Mark Udall was my white knight of presiding orders and switched time slots with me. So I didn't have to describe my uncomfortable feelings to that young 20-something. <laughs> I mean, look, that story itself says a lot about workplace rules that don't recognize the need for flexibility. And I will not ask you how you do it all or how you balance work and life, because you and I both know that every woman is asked that in every interview. I've yeah. never not been asked. You've never not been asked. And every man has never asked that. But what I do think that story shows is that there is tension for all of us, mm. right, and balance. And how, what have you learned about what needs to change in how we approach work? So that women don't have to feel uncomfortable right. explaining to someone what a breastfeeding schedule nurse, is. Yeah. So, or like, uh, <laughs> I remember like the men always would like bang when you're in the airplane pumping, which takes like 20 minutes and people are mad, right? All the women are nodding. And you're like, I'm sorry, it takes 20 minutes and people are banging on the door. Yeah, it's really horrible. Right? Um, so so I, I, I have this discussion of having it all. I really dislike the frame having it all because, first of all, the word having drives me crazy. What are we actually having? Are we having a party? Are we having a second slice of pie? We're clearly having something we're not supposed to be having. Correct. And then the second thing is all. And I hate that because it pits women against each other. It's saying the women who are staying at home with their children are somehow not living a full life because only women who are working have all. So I think we should just dispose of the whole frame, and we should talk about the far more relevant question of how do we support women and families in doing it all? Because women are doing it all. Most women are working because they must feed their children. Eight out of 10 moms, eight out of 10 moms are working. It is not the days of the Mad Men era where dad went to work and mom went at home. And for four to 10 moms, they are the sole or primary breadwinner. So what we should really start talking about is how do you make it possible to meet the needs of your family and meet the needs of your job and do it well. And what we do need to do, talk about is some of the unfairness structurally that we should be talking about. So for example, equal pay for equal work is absurd. The fact that eight out of 10 families aren't earning what they're due because a woman has, happens to be doing that job is absolutely unacceptable. Some other structural supports would go a long way. Something as simple as affordable daycare or universal pre-K will help any parent who has young children in those first five years. So those are the kinds of things we should all support. I also believe um, it's important to fight for something called um, paid leave. Now, right now we have unpaid leave, which means you can take up to three months off work at any time, any employee, um, uh, not any employee, you have to have at least 50 employees at your business, and you have to be working there for at least a year. So only about half of the workforce can actually take unpaid leave. We're the only industrialized country in the whole world, in the whole world, that doesn't have paid leave. Countries that don't educate their girls, Afghanistan and Pakistan, have more paid leaves than America. And what paid leave would do, if it was, a, it, it obviously should be gender neutral. It should be there for any family emergency. Whether, so whether it's a new baby, or whether it's a child or a family member who's gravely ill, or your parent who's dying and you need to spend time with them before they die, if you were able to buy in so there was an earned benefit, the cost of a cup of coffee a week, that would go so far for keeping family members, particularly women, in the workplace. Because inevitably, when someone's ramping off to deal with a fam family emergency, more often than not, it is the, it is the woman of the family. And, and it may be because she wants to, it may be because she needs to, but more often than not, it is her. And once you ramp off, all the studies show you never ramp on at the level you left. You ramp back on at a lower wage for less responsibility. So what it really means is it's an artificial drag on the economy because all these women are not earning at their full potential, not earning or, or, or working at their highest level 
because of all these family emergencies throughout their career. Um, and the biggest concern I have is what we call a sticky floor, which is the low-wage worker. Because a lot of times, great companies will have family leave, but they're almost all, always for professionals, the highest earners at the highest echelons, where law firms and businesses are desperate to keep their female talent. They figure it out and create the flexibility. That is not true for low-wage workers. So the woman who's going to clean this auditorium tonight, she's got fixed hours. She might not have sick days. She may not have vacation days. So she's given what she's, she gets. And if her child is sick and she misses work, she may lose her job, which means she starts over again at the bottom rung at a minimum wage job and never rises above. And so we should all concern ourselves with this sticky floor because two-thirds of minimum wage workers are women. And it has a lot to do with the fact that there's no support for their family emergencies. You've been a strong... You've been a strong advocate for us addressing these things. You've also been a very strong voice on what needs to be done legislatively and, and in a regulatory sense uh, for women and sexual assault in the military. On paid leave, on these issues, I think it's fair to say there's not a lot of legislation happening these mm -hmm. days. What is the real path? Um, Maybe well, right now, and what is the real path over the longer time? So something like paid leave. So there's two is answers. Is it possible to address The, the answer that relates to all of us right now is our voices need to be heard. Because I believe if our voices were heard, and we were heard in all states, red states, blue states, purple states, a lot of these issues would demand reaction. We would be able to say, we really should have equal pay in this country. We should really get rid of sexual assault on college campuses. These would be consensus items. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. They're, they're things we all strongly believe in. I think if women's voices were heard across the board uh, more loudly, a lot of this would be on the national agenda. Um, longer term, change the players list in Congress. And I would like very much, <laughs> I, I would like very much to have a Congress that reflects our population. I would like very much to have a Congress that shows the diversity of America, including having 51% of our members of Congress being women. Now, if we did have 51% of, of Congress being women, a couple of things would change. First of all, we would not have wasted two congressional sessions debating whether women should have access to affordable contraception. If it was 51% of women, it would not be on the agenda. The second thing would change, and I think this is uh, regardless of ideology, I think women are often, not always, but often very good at leaving the partisan politics at the door and trying to find common ground. Now, it comes from a number of reasons. Um, in the Senate, the women have taken the time to get to know each other first as women, as sisters, as daughters, as mothers. And we, we, we spend time together purposefully for that reason. And what it allows for is this not only willingness, but interest in each other succeeding. So every time I've ever passed a bill, I've had a strong Republican woman helping me. So don't ask, don't tell repeal. It was Susan Collins leading the charge among the Republicans, getting the few votes we needed. When it was the 9-11 health bill, it was Olympia Snow and... Lisa Murkowski going into the Republican caucus room saying, why aren't we standing with first responders? These are the men and women who raced up towers when everybody was racing down, and we should be standing by them at their hour of need. When we finally passed that bill, we passed it unanimously. Yeah. There's been a lot. <laughs> there have been lots of moments where we've seen what women can do coming together, yet I think we have uh, the kind of the tyranny of low expectations. So in the last election cycle, when women won 20% of the Senate seats, all the headlines kept saying, women take over the Senate, women take over the Senate. <laughs> I mean, a little bit of math, right? 51% <laughs> or 50% of the population with 20% of seats. It's not a takeover, it's a gap. Yeah, it's a massive gap. Um, but one of the big issues is people have noticed that if more women would vote for women, mm -hmm. that would make a big difference. Yes. Women really do determine outcomes of elections. And, and women's voices are so, so important in electoral politics. The only reason President Obama is president is because women voted for him. He lost the white male vote significantly, but his ability to attract the female vote across the board, all age groups, was so overwhelming he was able to win. That's true in all elections. And my book is really this call to action to ask all women to be heard because I believe whether women are Democrat, Republican, independent, or unaffiliated, they're going to have a certain sensibility. And that sensibility is going to be geared towards getting things done. So when someone's a Tea Party candidate and says all they want to do is shut down government and defund the Department of Education and you know 
make sure government can't do anything, I don't think a lot of women, regardless of political party, are going to support that kind of obstruction. They're going to support someone who's willing to listen, someone who's willing to put the values and the priorities of their families first. And that's why it's a call to action for all women, that all women's voices matter. And, and it really doesn't matter if it's on the federal level or on the local level, because if women are being heard in their local town council or on the PTA, outcomes are going to be better. They're going to have very different agendas. And the balance, the, the combination of the male and female is what's so powerful. Along with having more women in the Senate, it might be nice to have a woman in the White House. Yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons I wrote my book is uh, when my daughter was four, I, she learned a song with all the US presidents named for President's Day. And she looked up and she said, why are they all boys? Mm -hmm. So I think the leading female contender for the presidency say right now is Hillary Clinton. And you do talk a lot about her in the book. And you make this point you started making, which is that she was a mentor. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take a lot of time. Yeah. She was a mentor because she was important to you. Can you talk about that relationship, yeah. how you met her, why it mattered? How can someone mentor in 90 minutes over so many years and come out with you on the other side? I mean, I think we all want to know how to do that, right? Yeah, for sure. So um, I'll tell you my story of Hillary. So I was just a young lawyer sitting in New York City working on big cases. And I looked up long enough to see that our first lady was going to China. Now, I paid attention because I had studied in Beijing and had learned Mandarin. And I thought, gosh, our first lady is giving a speech about women's rights being human rights from Beijing. What a message for the world. And I was most upset because I wasn't invited to the conference. <laughs> and I thought, what would it have taken to be invited to that conference? And I realized I wasn't involved in politics. And so that's when I decided I need to somehow get in politics in New York City. So I called a girlfriend whose mom was involved and said, how do I get involved in New York City? And she said, join this women's group. It's called the Women's Leadership Forum. They're just starting out. They're an arm of the DNC. I said, fine. So I called the lady who's in charge and said, I want to join the WLF. And she says, well, you can absolutely join. You just need to write me a check for $1,000. And I'm just a 20-something. And $1,000 was a lot of money back then. And I thought, wow. I said, well, OK, I'll do it, because it's the only advice I've been given. So I write the check. And I go to my first big meeting, which is an event in New York City at the River Club. And Hillary Clinton's our speaker. And it was a big room like this. And I'm standing way in the back. And I'm the youngest by at least 10 or 20 years. And she gives this speech. And she looks out into the audience. And she says, Decisions are being made every day in Washington. And if you're not part of those decisions and you don't like what they decide, you have no one to blame but yourself. And so I'm thinking, oh my god, she's talking to me. <laughs> she's telling me I have to run for office. <laughs> I'm scared. So I'm very anxious about this and sweating in the back of this room. And, but it, it got me thinking that um, I really do care about politics. I learned all those lessons from my grandmother. I knew that women's voices were important. I knew that this conversation happening around the world was something I wanted to be part of. So I started getting involved in campaigns. And I decided I want to leave my big law firm. And I want to do public service. So I tried all different routes. And actually, all of them failed. My first effort was to go work at the US Attorney's Office. And I didn't get the job. My second effort was to apply to all the big foundations. I applied to the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, the Rockefeller Foundation. I didn't even get a response. And then Hillary decides to run for Senate. I said, oh, my big chance. I'm going to go work for Hillary. And I apply for whatever I can get. And I have no relevant experience. So I'm, I have no option. And so I go to another event. And this is after a year and a half of trying. And our speaker was Andrew Cuomo, who's our now governor and was then Secretary of HUD. And he gives this big speech about why public service matters and why you should be a Democrat and you should be making a difference. And by this point in my life, I'm so frustrated that I walk <laughs> up to him afterwards and say, well, Mr. Secretary, I loved your speech, but I really think politics is an insider's game. And I don't know how to get from A to B. And Andrew is a very provocative person. So he says, what do you do? I said, I'm a lawyer. I'm a seventh year associate at Davis Polk. He said, well, would you move to Washington? Now, that question to a young single girl living in New York City no one would ever have an interest in moving to Washington. <laughs> but I, of course, say, of course. And so I get a call the next day. I go down and interview, and I get a job to be his special counsel. And I go home that night, and I, I talk to uh, my then boyfriend, now husband. And this is an important lesson that Cheryl definitely shares in her book, that we all need a certain partner in our lives. We need somebody who believes in us, supports us, encourages us, particularly at the right moments. And Jonathan has always been that person for me. And he just said, Kirsten. Davis Polk doesn't need you. All you've ever wanted to do is public service. I'll see you on the weekends. Of course you should take the job. So I call up Andrew the next day, take the job. Two weeks later, I'm in DC. 
And so this is the end of the Clinton administration. The, the Democrats lose, Bush v. Gore, um, my job's finished in seven months. But it really sets me in motion that I want to do public service. And so Hillary runs. I start working on her campaign. I get really excited. She asked me to do a fundraiser. I'm determined to do the best fundraiser ever in the history of ever. So I work really hard. And she gets elected. And I stay in touch with her. And, and because I work so hard for her, she remembers me. And so she calls me afterwards. Oh, Kirsten, thank you for that lovely fundraiser. I disclose in the book that the time that we finally had one conversation that just wasn't a thank you, Kirsten, for working so hard was when my father meets her at a cocktail party. And he, of course, charms her the whole time. And so I get a call the next day saying, I met your father. He's so charming. And I had this 10-minute long conversation with Hillary because my father was so charming. <laughs> Slightly undermining. But um, so I, I continue with all my efforts to you know, do my hard work. And I eventually decide I, I want to move upstate New York, and I want to run for Congress. And, in 2004, I'm looking at this district, and it's two to one Republican, really hard. And I'm pregnant, and so I call Hillary, and uh, she, or maybe I just had the baby, and I was like, I'm looking at the district, and she's like, What about the baby? I was like, Well, you know, uh, what about Jonathan? And what about? And she asked me all these tough questions I had no good answers to. So she didn't tell me don't run, but she didn't tell me to run. So I realized that. Maybe I don't know enough. So I spend the next two years going to all these campaign training schools and really figuring out what is it like to run for Congress. I really don't know the answers to her questions, but I will get those answers. So I do all this training. And before the next cycle, Jonathan and I decide to do a poll. And we know more about the district. And so I call Hillary again. This is my next mentoring moment. And she's got the poll. And she's like, I've already looked at the poll. And she had all these questions. And I knew all the answers this time. And she said at the end, well, Kirsten, she said, you just have to know in your heart while you're running. You have to know that whether you win or lose, it's something that's in your heart, and you have to make a difference. And she said, I will do anything you need me to do, and so will my husband. And so, <laughs> and they did. And so they really helped me get elected. They, they did events. They did fundraisers. They came to the district. And President Clinton came up the day before the election. So on election morning, every photo of every paper is me and Bill Clinton going like this. It was one of those miracle elections. We won by six points. So. <laughs> So I have to ask, how are you feeling about uh, her possibilities for president in 2016? Well, I hope she runs. I have encouraged her to run. I have told her I will do anything it takes to help her win when she runs. So I'm very optimistic. I think she will run. And I think she's a great candidate. I think the fact that she's been our Secretary of State, she not only has the gravitas and experience that we desperately need in these very, very tough times um, in terms of international policy, but she also has done an enormous amount of work domestically. And so I, I really feel like her candidacy is so strong, and I feel she'll be a great president. So I'm going to work very hard to get her elected. <laughs> and, uh, and do you think one day we'll be having that same conversation about you? No. Um, I aspire to stay in the Senate. I really love my job. And I feel like I can make a huge difference there. And I feel like on the issues that I often work on, they're issues that have no champions. They're issues that, you know, these are issues like sexual assault in the military or college campus have lingered for far too long without a champion. Issues as simple as making sure families that don't have enough food have access to healthy food. Again, it's, it's an uphill battle. And so I feel like I can continue to really make a difference where I am, and so that's what I hope to do. All right. So we're going to do a lightning round, and I'm going to ask people to get ready to ask questions. After this, we're going to open the mic for questions. I think we're bringing mics to the, yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Um, so the way this works is you don't think, you answer. Just the answer. Just yep. the answer. Got it. Got it. Early bird or night owl? Early bird. First thing you do in the morning? Um, tell my six-year-old son that I will make him breakfast. Because it starts with, Mommy, I'm starving. Could you make breakfast? <laughs> yes, Henry, I will make breakfast. Last thing at night. Kiss my husband goodnight. <laughs> Favorite pizza topping? Plain. <laughs> Cheese. Cheese. Cheese, yeah. yeah. But it's not a topping. It's not a topping. <laughs> You're right. It's just that's how they make that's pizza. Fair. So that's it's fair. no it's topping. topping. That's fair. Cats or dogs? I'm allergic to cats. I do love them, so I'd have to say dogs. Mm. Movies or TV shows? I like movies. Beach or mountain? Both. Chocolate or vanilla? Both. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Both. <laughs> Heels or flats? Flats. Flats. <laughs> flats. Hardcover or ebook? 
Hardcover. Women in the Senate or men in the Senate? Oh, dear. <laughs> Women? <laughs> Senate Armed Services Committee, Agriculture Committee, or Aging Committee? All of the above. <laughs> Can't Dar choose. Dartmouth or UCLA? They're both great schools. <laughs> New York City or Washington, D.C.? Oh, New York City. <laughs> Upstate. That's very nice as well. If you could time travel, forward or back? Um, hmm, very good question. Um, forward. Your favorite piece of advice you've ever been given? Be exactly yourself. Thank you. So we're going to open up for questions. Um, do you believe that this normalized atmosphere of sexual harassment in high schools translates to places as prestigious as the U.S. Senate? And if so, what can we do to prevent that? Yes, and we have to speak up and be heard. I'm really concerned about what's happening on college campuses right now. Um, they haven't fully studied it, but the one study they do have showed an indication that one out of five girls are raped during their college career, and that it usually happens in the first few months. So what we know is that a lot of these rapes are targeted rapes by recidivists um, who are truly um, um, victimizing these young men and w young women. And so what we're trying to do is create a spotlight on it. And the big question for a lot of universities and communities is, these are serious crimes. What does the college have to do with this anyway? And that's a legitimate question because they are serious crimes. These are rapes that would result in jail time. But the reason why we have to hold our colleges accountable is because of Title IX. Title IX requires that um, universities create a safe environment for all students. And so they are obligated to have a process in place if a rape or assault takes place on a campus, how they respond. And so what I'm trying to do with my colleagues in the Senate is work on a bill to do that. And the reason why this has become such a national issue is because of some very brave young girls. Um, two women asked, they came to my office and said, Kirsten's been working on sexual assault in the military, but we have to tell her what's happening in college campuses. We need a meeting. My staff was smart enough to make that meeting happen, and I sat down with them. Their names are Andrea and, and, and uh, Annie, and they basically told me the story about how they were both brutally raped in North Carolina. They reported the rape. Their college administrators didn't believe them. They blamed them, and then they retaliated against them for reporting it. That cannot happen in a college campus in America. So they've gone campus to campus getting uh, men and women to stand up, speaking truth to power, demanding action. And the bill that we've written really was informed by their experiences. So we're trying to flip the incentives to make sure it's worth the while of these schools to get it right, to report as they're supposed to, and to put procedures in place to prevent this from happening. But I think it's something we all have to talk about. But it goes to a fundamental issue, which is far bigger than high school or college, and that's whether we value women in society. So whether you're talking about the NFL, and you have a known player who admits to beating his wife. You have a video of him dragging her out of an elevator in the most disrespectful way, and he's given the slap on the wrist. It's hugely problematic, because what you're talking about is we don't value women. When the Department of Defense won't reform itself because it doesn't care that there were 26,000 rapes last year and only one in 10 reported because they want to put their arms institutionally around that favored soldier, or a school that institutionally puts their arms around that favored quarterback. You know, it happens over and over again where the institutional bias um, maintains a status quo because they, uh, they don't want to be held accountable. It will hurt their recruiting. It will hurt their um, reputations. It'll hurt you know, the, the, the game on Sunday because it's a star player. It's a problem. And so all of us, mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, we have to demand more from our leaders, from our institutions to value women. And that's really what it goes to every time. Thank you. I've done a lot of campaigning over the years for women. And so often, even after I've run down all of the you know, issues that the woman is strong on, when I'm talking to a woman, she'll say, well, I'm not going to vote for her just because she's a woman. How would you respond to that? Well, I don't think you should vote for someone just because they're a woman. You should vote for the person who shares your values. And, and that may be a woman, it might be a man. So you have to focus on what you care deeply about and who's going to represent those values the best. Um, if it's apples to apples, then through that female candidate, you may well get a different perspective. You may well get a different life experience that will enrich the conversation and enrich the advocacy. So if you have an apples to apples, I might tend to favor the female because I want that diversity. 
Just as in corporate America, when you have diversity on your corporate boards, those companies perform better because it's the difference in life experience that informs the debate. When one woman is on a corporate board, that company is 40% less likely to restate their earnings. That is very significant. <laughs> I would be eager to put a woman on my corporate board if she's going to steer my company in a better direction. So it's important um, in and of itself to have the diversity, but always support the candidate that shares your values, because that's really what it's most about. Thank you, Senator. Could you share with us how you are encouraging women to run for the Senate? Well, um, anybody who's willing or interested, I try to sit down with, encourage them, explain what the experience is really like. Almost inevitably, the questions I get from female candidates is, well, what do you do about your kids? And how does that work? And what about your husband? And what does it look like? They want to know the nuts and bolts. And so if I can explain how to manage this particular career with your family goals, I'm always happy to do that. But that's not unusual for a woman to know. When I was first considering running for the House, I called Debbie Wasserman Schultz and asked her, you know, you have two kids, what's your life like? And so she explained what her challenges were, how she worked through them, and that just allayed my fears. For a lot of us as moms, we're afraid that we'll let our kids down or somehow not provide for our families in the way that's consistent with who we are. But you can always make it work. And for most women working, they don't have a choice anyway. Because if they're not working, that kid's not getting fed. So we will all figure it out. Some companies, some employers are kinder and more welcoming than others. Some have better workplace policies than others. But all of us can advocate where we are to make those policies better. But for a woman candidate, um, one of the ways I typically get her to say yes to run is to talk about what she cares about. Because it's never about you. When in politics, it is not about you. It doesn't matter who you are. It's what you care about. And so if that woman wants to end gun violence, I talk about how there's no leadership on ending gun violence right now in the US Congress. And she needs to run so she can be that voice to say, no, we must, as a nation, do something about this scourge. That will motivate her to run. Because when it's not about her and it's what she cares about, she will, she will climb mountains for that, for that cause. And I think it is such an important example. We can't be what we can't see. And so those women who get to sit down with you are not just sitting down with someone who's hypothetically explaining what it's mm -hmm. like. They're sitting down with the US senator right. with kids. Right. And so I want to thank you for the question and thank you for the example you're setting. Thank you. Uh, in your book, you talk about the plight of uh, women who work as waitresses and are paid only $2.13 an hour yeah. and have to rely on their tips to be yeah. the, in, the entire uh, wage there. And that the result of that is the huge rates of sexual harassment in the restaurant industry that's uh, five times higher than any other uh, industry in the country. Uh, in the Senate bill to raise the minimum wage, there really is a very little attempt to deal with this. It does raise the tipped wage from $2 to, to $7. Seven yeah. But it's kind of ironic, uh, don't you think, that we complain that women are paid 70% of what men are paid. And here in the minimum wage bill, we are legislating that a women's profession is to be paid 70% of what a men's yeah, profession. I, um, if I was to write the bill myself, I would eliminate the tipped wage. I just think there should be one minimum wage. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, period, and then tips can be on top of that. But I would eliminate it entirely. And I think the way the bill was written, I just think the way it was, the bill was written, uh, a lot of the advocacy was towards just increasing it as opposed to eliminating it. And I think if we were going to write it today, we would eliminate it. So I will support that bill, but I would also support a bill to eliminate it entirely. And I think that is where the nation should go. And it's, I think it's also where we should be advocating on the state level. And that wage has to be living. And for this room, I doubt many of you have lived a minimum wage. But let me explain. It's $15,000 a year. If you have two kids, it means you're $3,000 below the poverty line. And the reason why I'm so concerned about it is we've always believed in this country that if you work hard, you will make it to the middle class. Well, that is not true. Because if you are earning the minimum wage, you are working 40 hours a week, and you have to add a second job on top of that, and you pro probably will never make it into the middle class because of the sticky floor. Because without all these structural supports, getting out of that low-wage job is nearly impossible, particularly if you're a single mom. So that's one of our challenges, that we have to make our minimum wage a living wage so more women can provide for their kids, can provide for their families, and eventually earn enough to start saving to make their way to the middle class. But without the structural supports, they don't have a chance. They don't have a chance. They don't have a shot. There's no way it's going to happen without any help, with no sick days or vacation days. 
it's just going to it's going to end poorly and it, and it typically means they get fired or you know constantly recycled back to the lowest wage the bottom rung and it's a disservice to the country it's an ar artificial drag on our economy all that money gets spent I do believe that government can do a lot to improve those structural um, supports, but I also believe that business has to do something. I've spent my entire career in finance, um, half of it on the sell side, which means on the advisor side, investment banking, and the other half in investment management and private equity. And there were very few women in investment banking, but there are even fewer women. In fact, they're almost an extinct species when it comes to investment management especially private equity. Now, <laughs> now in, in Europe, they've passed reform laws, which they're trying to you know, encourage basically a quota, and there was some talk here in California. I'm not always sure quotas is the best thing, but I think we, we need to move it to at least a third, because I think government can achieve only so much, but you need to also achieve it in business. And I think I would love from both of your, your perspectives, how do we achieve that? Is it through mentorship? Is it through quotas? Is it through training? or saying to LPs who fund some of these private equity companies, which then, or funds, which fund companies, you know, you need to have so many women, you need to provide them training. I'm just, I have my own ideas, but I'd really like to hear what you guys think about it, because I think it's not just government, it's, it's business too. There's a really good book, it's called Lean In. Um, <laughs> it talks about a lot of these issues, but I think you definitely need to do both. But Cheryl, why don't you say whatever you want to say? I, so the first thing I'll say is it's not an industry specific problem. Everyone believes it's in their industry because it's in all. Yeah. That's the first thing. It's in, yes, it's in finance. Yes, it's in tech. But it's also in education and nonprofits. The nonprofit workforce of this country is 75% women. Do you know how many women run the big nonprofits? 21. Mm. And so we have this problem everywhere. It is worse in some industries, but even the industries it's really good in, it's not that good. So we have to take it as a leadership problem across the board. Um, I'm not a legislative expert. The history on quotas in this are that they move exactly what is quoted and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So in Norway, Norway has had for over a decade quotas of women in parliament, 40% and quotas for women on corporate boards. And a decade later, there are 40% women in parliament and 40% women on corporate boards. And you know how many women run their big companies? Three and a half percent. Mm. It didn't trickle down. Right. And so. I think we need to take broad action, and it goes to encouraging our daughters. So by seventh grade, seventh grade, including in San Francisco, uh, parents have higher aspirations for their sons and their daughters, mm. right there. It goes to not calling our daughters bossy, mm -hmm. because we would never say a son is bossy, right? Oh, you know? Henry's definitely bossy. He's so <laughs> bossy. My son is the bossiest little boots I've ever met in my life. <laughs> And it goes towards systematically making work work for women. Yeah, Every woman I know who's been in the workforce, myself included, has her story of trying to pump yeah. if you're breastfeeding. Every one of us. It's not welcome. It's harder. And things are getting better. They're getting better in some industries, not other. Yeah. The one thing I'll also add, because we are in San Francisco, is the tech industry, while it has its challenges and those we're working on, they're also very flexible jobs. And if we can get more women into computer science, right now that percentage is 18%. Mm. On the other side of those jobs, it's as flexible as you want to be. If you are in computer science in this city, in any of these companies or any of the ones in the valley, no one tells you what time to show up. They're just I, glad you come. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> and so teaching women that they can do anything, making sure our workforce policies are as flexible. There can be a lot more flexibility in almost every industry than we offer and encouraging women to do things that they don't traditionally see themselves is a big part of the answer. I, I totally agree with Cheryl, and to amplify her message, so one of my goals legislatively is to get more girls and minorities into STEM, because all these Silicon Valley jobs, all these tech jobs require proficiency in science, technology, engineering, and math, but we will steer our daughters and minorities away from math and science at the earliest stages, and so all the studies show that if you can get kids engaged when they're young, teaching the third grader to build a rocket, teaching the fifth grader to build a robot, that hands-on learning translates very well to getting more kids interested in STEM subjects. Um, and here's just a very anecdotal example, but it shows the challenge. So one day when I was picking up Henry from pre-K, he's playing with trains. Okay, A lot of little boys love trains, they like to build, they like anything with wheels, that's what they do. So his best friend at the time, Sadie, is standing next to him, and she's placing all the people next to the train lines. And Sadie, of course, is talking about where the people are going, and the mommy and the baby are going here and doing this. 
So my question is this. My son definitely dreams of being a train engineer. He wants to build trains, build transportation networks. But I want Sadie also to dream to be a train engineer because Sadie, unlike Henry, really is interested in where the people want to go and what they're going to do when they get there. <laughs> so imagine what great uh, city planner Sadie will become because she really cares about what the people are thinking and doing. So that together shows the gifts and what women have to offer because our worldview is often different. So I do think we need to inspire more young, young women and girls to want to do these science, technology, engineering, and math degrees. Um, and then we also have to try to keep them in the workforce by doing these supports. The best way to get companies to respond is to make the business case. Mm -hmm. And so I love the fact that some of the best companies in America are doing that right now. So Ernst & Young has done a billion reports about why women in corporate America actually are high performers, why they do result in returns on investment being higher, why the typical style of female in management, women in management may well be different, but it's a very complementary style and one that's very powerful. It's often driven by consensus. It's often driven by other gifts. And so if we can make the case about what women are doing and bringing to the table, all businesses will want to retain them, not just the highest earning professional businesses where they see that these accountants are great, these lawyers are great, these business leaders are great. So making the business case is the way to persuade the private sector, in my opinion, and yes. then creating the structural supports to make sure we're creating the pipeline so the women and girls are ready to take on these, these roles in the highest and fastest growing industries. Yeah, that's exactly right. So at Facebook, we offer four months of maternity and four months of paternity leave. It's very unusual. It's for business. Is it we, paid? It's paid. And it is done. But why are we doing it? Because we've invested a lot in our people and we want them back. And you don't want to replace them. We and don't want to replace them. Loyal. And it's the business case. I think yeah. the business case is how you appeal across the board. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I've come to believe that the most effective recipe for social change lies at the intersection of technology and politics. And that is where I devote my time and my energy. And I first want to say that I don't think I could even imagine that without such outspoken role models like the two of you. So I want to start by saying thank you for that. Um, yeah. So my question is, 13% um, of women in this country are foreign born. And my question is, how can we empower those women when the immigration laws in our country undermine them so much? Mm -hmm. Over to you, because I think yeah, our immigration no, laws immigration, are so broken. <laughs> yeah, they're totally broken. And it's one of the problems with women not being heard across this country, because uh, we have a bill in the Senate that's decent, it's not perfect, but it solves a lot of the biggest challenges. It creates a pathway to citizenship for everyone that's here. For any kid brought by their parents, they can have their pathway per the DREAM Act. Any uh, visa issues, they blow the caps on the high expertise visas along with agricultural vita visas and other ones that are necessary to do all the industries that we value so greatly for immigrant workers. Um, but the, the most important part of that bill is the fact that on day one they're in status. So every person can now, without any worry, buy into Social Security, buy into Medicare and Medicaid, buy into the social safety nets and pay their taxes and not have to be concerned uh, that they're going to get in trouble. So that is very valuable. The fact that the House of Representatives won't even take up an immigration bill is disgraceful. And I think if more people are heard across the country that we, dis that we are so disappointed that the lack of leadership in the House uh, won't even begin to debate a bill, it just shows a failure and it's a huge failure. So the more I can create a call to action to ask people to be heard across all states, across all ideologic lines, maybe we can get more things done. Um, but it's, it's, it's really a shame because for me, immigration reform is an economic engine. It is a massive economic engine. And for my state, a state built on immigrants, uh, part of the richness of our heritage and culture is because of our immigrant roots, because of our cultural backgrounds. And we should want to continue to grow that and enhance that. And it's a mistake not to. Yeah. I want to thank you both for everything you're doing to elevate the next generation of women. It's really inspiring. And as a member of the LEVO team, you guys have both been office hours mentors, and it's cool to see you both on the same stage. But despite everything you're doing for so many women, I want to know how you both are enrolling men as your allies and the ways that you do that, because I know that that's been a huge part of both of your success. Well, Cheryl talks about some of the great mentors she had who were men. Um, I had... Uh, Certainly Andrew Cuomo was a mentor. He gave me my first shot in public service. Um, Senator Schumer has been extremely gracious as my partner in representing New York State. So we as women can reach out to men and women to be our mentors. 
Um, it's more helpful to have female role models because their worldview and the way they live their lives is more reflective of the way we're going to live our lives typically. Um, but you can have that benefit. And a, and a male sponsor, typically that's going to be extremely valuable because more often than not, men are in the highest power decision-making roles in any company and anywhere in the country. So um, having men invest in you and your career is vital. So when we do, for example, we have a really good mentor program in New York City that um, the New York City Partnership runs. Um, all the mentees are women, but uh, more than half the mentors are men. So we can all help each other. And it's about making sure all voices are heard and all opportunities are provided. I think it's exactly that. It's making the business case or the personal case to men in the home and the office. So in the office, if you are an entry-level employee or CEO or, any, or senator, if you can work better with half the population, you will outperform. Mm -hmm. And so there is a reason to care about equality because it will help your career and your companies or your nonprofits or your public office. As a father, this is a big, big deal. We know that at any income level, regardless of how active a mother is, children with more active fathers have better outcomes. Emotional outcomes, happiness, school, education, and uh, careers. We know that. There's a new study that I find fascinating that just came out. It's a study of 14-year-old girls. And what they found is that if a 14-year-old girl has a father who does more housework, does more housework, that 14-year-old girl has broader career aspirations for herself. If a 14-year-old girl has a father who talks about how she can do anything in equality but doesn't ever wash a dish, that girl will believe she can be a stay-at-home mom, a nurse, an educator, all of which are great, but traditionally female professions. If the 14-year-old girl has a father who does stuff in the house with the mother, or a father figure in your life who does real housework or real childcare, that 14-year-old girl believes she can be all of those things, which is great, but also a scientist, an astronaut, a surgeon. And so we're setting the examples in our homes every day. And what I think compels men as fathers is that this is good for your children. And it's not what you say, it's what you do. Shale Sandberg, do the dishes, dads. Do the dishes, dads. Correct. <laughs> Johnny is very good at the dishes. He is not as good at the laundry. But that's OK. But that's OK. Laundry. Dishes is great. You get that done for me, I am so happy. That's OK. I've Jeez. said publicly that the way to have more sex with your wife is to do laundry. <laughs> um, and it's true. It's true. Any woman in this audience, would you rather have flowers or laundry help? OK. And then I heard a story of a woman whose husband picked up a load of laundry and kind of turned around and was like, is this Cheryl Sandberg laundry? <laughs> is this leading somewhere? Because if this is leading somewhere, I am psyched to do this. But if this is not, there's a game on. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you get the last question. Um, so there was new data released this morning by the Women Donors Network and the Center for American Progress that shows that 65% of all office holders are uh, white men, while only being 31% of the population. So do you have any s steps or things that we can do to create a more reflective democracy? And just before you ask, we are going to take one more question afterwards so you can get ready. Okay. <laughs> um, you should run for office. Yes. <laughs> that would help us a lot if you did. Um, again, we just have to create this call to action. It's, I liken it to what Rosie the Riveter was during World War II. If you remember that iconic advertising image, it was a woman with her sleeves rolled up, slogan, we can do it. And it told women two things. Number one, that they, that they could do these jobs in the war industries while men were fighting in World War II. But second, it told them that they would make the difference. I think if you tell all American women that if your voices are heard, not only can you do and change the outcomes, but your voice will actually make the difference. You can get more women to realize that their voice is unique, important, and it needs to be heard. We need more women running. We need more women aspiring to take leadership roles, whether it's at the PTA meeting or whether it's at the boardroom. Um, if, if, we, if we can encourage women by telling them that their voice is unique and important and it would make the difference, they will respond. They are very, very generous. Six million women entered the workforce because of Rosie the Riveter. Imagine what six million more women voting or running for office or holding these elected leaders accountable would do for America. It would be very, very powerful. Yay. All right. And you get the actual last question. 
Thank you for taking it. Um, my name is Sophie. I am a Berkeley student, and I spearheaded the Title IX complaints uh, against Berkeley. And Annie and Andrea wanted me to tell you hello. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a lot of the time, well, congratulations. People, Let's start there. Thank you. <laughs> um, a lot of the time, people ask, you know, exactly what you alluded to before, which is, well, what is the role of the campus? There's these police officers who are probably mm -hmm. supposed to be dealing with this, and. I never really have a good answer for why the criminal justice system is so broken and what we can do to fix it for sexual assault survivors. And I was wondering if you happen to have any insights on that. Well, the reason why it's broken is because of the institutional bias that's throughout all jurisdictions, all institutions. It's not surprising that we are having this debate about the NFL. Um, when I was debating sexual assault in the military, they were prosecuting 1% of rape cases when the civilian system was prosecuting 2% of rape cases, so both abysmal in terms of performance. And so we have these structural challenges that uh, these institutions aren't valuing women and not believing them when they report these rapes, not taking these crimes as serious crimes. What's working in criminal justice, which is interesting, is a new approach where you ask law enforcement about trying to tackle the recidivists. And the way they do that is say, that first person who comes in you need to counsel her about what her rights and her and what her options are in a very holistic way because she may not be willing to report and prosecute on the first day but two months later when a second rape takes place and you are able to go back to her and say the same fact pattern has just emerged we think it's the same guy do you feel comfortable you know prosecuting if we can have this other second rape be a collaborator that results in amazing results for these police departments so where they're where they're instituting this know your options approach, it is working. So we want to mirror that on the college campus so the first person a rape survivor talks to can advise her, him or her, on all their options, on everything that is available to them through the college, through law enforcement, so that over time, when she has time to think about what she wants, what kind of justice she's hoping to achieve, whether she wants to put herself out there, she will be not only fully informed, but not afraid um, a lot of the current climate, it, whether it's a police department, a school, or the Depar or, or, um, Department of Defense in the military, is the first conversation goes very badly. It's your fault. You were wearing that short skirt. You were drinking. Uh, you, you're saying to me that the guy who's married with two kids raped you. Well, that would mean adultery. I'll prosecute you for adultery. Um, or I'll prosecute you for <coughs> drinking. That first conversation goes so badly that the survivor doesn't feel comfortable going the next step. And that's really problematic because the studies all show these rapists are recidivists. They are targeting their victims in advance, picking the most vulnerable. That's why the typical rape survivor on a college campus is a freshman. It's typically first few weeks of school, when she's targeted, invited to the party, given too many drinks, and taken advantage of. That happens over and over again. So uh, thank you for the work you're doing. Um, I think by being so brave and being heard and holding your campus accountable, you are starting a movement. Your voice is more powerful than any college president, than any college board member, and you should feel really proud that you are saving lives and protecting others. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, It's a perfect way to end because I want to say the same thing to you, Senator wow. Gillibrand, for your voice, uh, for your belief in women, for your belief in equality, and for your belief in the kind of public service that makes this country better. I know I'm grateful, and I believe everyone here is grateful to you, you for Cheryl. your service. Thank you.